The following is a conversation with Rick Martis, the founder of the Continental Breeding Station in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, USA. Rick has been one of the most successful fanciers in the USA, winning the top prizes in the American Racing Pigeon Union's national awards, including many times first President's Cup. He currently is first uh, champion loft in Youngbirds for 2023. Rick's one of my favorite people to talk pigeons with, and it was nice enough to give me a little over an hour of his time just talking pigeons, going through the history, and I can't wait to share it with you all here. Please like, subscribe, and leave a comment on the video. Thank you. I, I think that uh, your story needs to be documented and talked about. Uh, you've been at the top of the racing pigeon sport here in the U.S. and uh, over in Belgium and, and been all, all over, you know, doing the uh, videos that you did in the past, the VHS tapes. I still have some here on my desk and, you know, all the people you've been able to meet and all the personal success you've had needs to be documented. Well, it's been a lifetime's passion, that's for sure. Well, I'm sure everybody watching is going to know the name Rick Martis and, and CBS. Can you give a little bit of the beginning? Where where did it begin for you? On CBS or pigeons in general? Well, let's start in pigeons in general, then okay. we'll get to CBS. Yeah, I started with pigeons when I was 12 years old in uh, 1960. I joined a club in 63. We had a little junior club for a while, uh, six or seven of us in the neighborhood. And what's interesting, three of us still have pigeons. Oh, wow. Uh, and junior club. Oklahoma? And one of them is Phil Woods. He's president of the Denton Club. Right. And, or, the, or the North Texas Combine, excuse me. But uh, anyway, so started with that when I was uh, in 63. My dad joined the club because he had to be 16 to get in the club. I couldn't join. Right. I uh, started flying in the Young Birds that year. And then uh, progressed all through uh, – High school had pigeons, had in college a little bit. Then I went in the service and I was stationed in Fort Monmouth, New Jersey in the Signal Corps. And I was hooked up with, uh, I flew partners with a guy in the Central Jersey Combine. And I was in the same club as Otto Meyer, who was the commander of the Pigeon Corps during World War II. And wow. he and I became great friends. And that was a real nice experience, really a nice experience. And then when I got out of the service, I immediately got the birds. Uh, got my birds back actually. Warren Glover, who some people may know was in Dallas, he kept the birds, uh, the breeders, and I immediately got back in and started flying and uh, and started racing, had successes in uh, uh, 73, I think. I flew first time I ever flew Wood Hood. Where, flew, where were you located, Rick, when you were in, doing in Dallas area? Okay, in, proper flew in the Dallas Limited Club. And that's the first club I actually joined when I was uh, 14. And, uh, but, uh, and then I uh, moved to Oklahoma. I flew there. I became president of the combine in Dallas. I built the Dallas clubhouse as president. We built the clubhouse and I was very active and had success and, and uh, had a couple of really outstanding years, but then real estate, I got involved in real estate and, it kind of took over a lot of business, and I would say my success wasn't as quite as good as it had been earlier once I really started working hard to make money. Right. Uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, I moved to Oklahoma in 82. I bought a piece of property that was a uh, par three golf course driving range, but I bought it to develop it out to housing addition. And so I moved up here in 82 and flew 82 young birds. Uh, here in Oklahoma City and uh, won the first two races I flew up here and kind of re-motivated me, re-challenged to be in some place new and uh, I started flying and then in the mid 80s, I was 84, 85, we were doing the uh, uh, development. I started that real estate and I bought a lot of money to put this project in on 20 acres and the bottom fell out of the real estate business. Uh, that's when the oil business in Oklahoma, people know, busted in the Penn Square Bank, the banks closed. 
And so it, it became a little bit difficult. And I, I had bought some expensive pitches from Europe. I bought some lean boars mm -hmm. and I bought a, several of them. I paid a lot of money for them and I was selling some of their offspring to recuperate what I put in them. And all of a sudden when the real estate business died, I, I really didn't make any real money. I was liquidating other properties to survive. And I decided to start CBS. I thought I could do sell pigeons and uh, preach bad times until things turned around. But the pigeon business kept going and going and going. So in 1987, I started CBS. 1987, and, that's the year I was born. Yep. It's <laughs> a long time. Then I went, I went to Europe for the first time in 84 with Horst Hackemer, who passed away a couple of years ago, with a good friend of mine. And uh been going ever since uh, four or five times a year for often i did race in belgium with serge van elsacker in a partnership i kept an apartment in a car there and did that for five years and we had a lot of fun it was it it was a real challenge you know i think any hardcore pigeon flyer would like to have done it and it, and it was it was a total total commitment a total commitment but i loved it was yeah. the uh, was it a culture shock for you going from racing in Dallas and then in Oklahoma City to racing over there? Well, uh, it's sure much more difficult. Uh, I wouldn't say much a culture shock because I'd been going to Belgium for several years already. I was pretty well aware of what was going on, so it wasn't uh, brand new to me, but it was a total commitment. We were in the club three, four days a week. We were basketing pigeons. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, uh, we'd fly four or five races a weekend. And uh, uh, I'd start in the lofts at about 7.30 in the morning. It could have started earlier because sunrise was early, but sunset wasn't until in the summer till 10.30. So we, we started about 7.30 and we'd have to exercise the old cocks, the old hens, the young birds, and then finish up about 11 and then my wife would spend the summers with me over there and we, she took an aerobics class uh, in the town Serge lived in Shilda. She rode the bus from our apartment there and I'd pick her up after we're done at the lofts and then we'd go to the apartment and eat lunch and come back. I'd come back usually 3.30 or 4 o'clock. We normally only flew the cocks in the evening, uh, but we were shipping a lot of times, even we have shipped on Tuesday nights, but Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So it was, and uh, back then we were still using manual clocks. Right. And so it, it, uh, we'd actually ship one night at one club, a different night in a different club. And uh, we'd make sure the counter marks were, you could request a different color counter mark so you didn't have collar marks on two races the same color so you knew what clocks to put them in sure and oh, um, so it was a real challenge but oh, at the yeah. same time it enabled me to really uh learn europe learn uh good pigeons and uh, but that didn't happen i didn't start racing in europe until 99 so i'd already been going a long time to europe well, let's time. back up to CBS then. So you you yeah. started CBS and we're racing in Oklahoma City. When when was it that you decided you wanted to go over to Belgium, go over to Europe and start uh, acquiring birds and and you know yeah. making relationships over there? Well, I went. I first time I went to Europe was I told you in '84. I went with actually a fellow named Ken Wetzel who actually owned Seagulls at the time before Menville did. Gotcha. Uh, Charles Siegel and Horst Hackmark. And the one thing that was beneficial to me right off the bat, they wanted me to drive. For some reason, they didn't want to drive over there. They wanted me to drive. And I was comfortable having grown up in Dallas driving traffic. So it got me oriented driving in Europe. And so that was good. So uh, I bought pigeons for me, for my own personal use. I wasn't, and then like I said, about 86, I decided I was going to create CBS I bought a new house where my son lives now at that time and uh, built the, the breeding station and uh, started acquiring birds. And a uh, uh, funny story is I bought $50,000 from the bank to buy pigeons. Oh, wow. And I bought a million dollars from the bank for the real estate development. 
And the, the guy said, my loan officer said, the million wasn't a problem, but that 50 for birds was, I had to get over <laughs> the board. It wasn't easy. But initially, I traveled all over Belgium and Holland, and I became acquainted with a guy in Holland named Michael Berg, who's an auctioneer at the time, and uh, became good friends with him. And I used him in, in Holland to help me find the birds. And in the early days, there were four newspapers, two in Belgium and two in Holland, that had all the results because the re there was no internet. And so I paid air I paid for air mail on those newspapers. So I'd get them in about a week after they were published and I could see the results and on all the clubs because all the results were in the newspapers. That's what people saw. Them. And um, so that's how I started figuring out where I wanted to go look for birds besides the names we heard. Right. But uh, usually I'd spot a club where there was a couple of good flyers, but if somebody knew I didn't recognize the name was, I wouldn't say beating them, but flying every bit as good as they were, then I wanted to go there. Right. And, and at those days, the, it was before the Euro, it was the Belgium Frank and the Dutch Gilders. Oh, and, wow. and so the dollar in the early days was very strong against European currency. And so the buying power was really good. And the prices weren't crazy then. And the prices didn't go crazy till the Chinese got involved, actually. Uh, okay. And what, what would be a, a top quality bird over there back then, price wise? Well, let's say a, a bird that had a really good race record, maybe seven or eight first and uh, a couple against a couple of thousand, three thousand to five thousand dollars. Yeah. Yeah, and definitely whereas now it's days. right now you can't do that you know? right and the other thing was that the birds were uh uh typically back in those days what you would do is buy a round of birds off the people's breeders that was the kind of the going system right. and so if you tuck a complete round you got them off every good pigeon in the loft off every breeder and so uh and typically i'd buy make a deal by 20 to 30 youngsters and the way cbs was set up we had 16 nest boxes in each section so i tried to get enough from a guy so i'd have a whole pen of 16 pairs from his pigeons so i'd make a deal for 30 to 35 to 40 birds but i always made the deal that i could reject something if i didn't like it right and get stuck with it right and, and uh so uh but back in the early days i could buy them youngsters for about a hundred dollars a piece right and quarantine wasn't but about fifty dollars a bird and i had shipments where i bought out complete lofts and stuff i had shipments over 300 pigeons a few times right and uh, everything was for sale at cbs i would offer any of the imports i bought were for sale of course if i didn't want to sell them i priced them appropriately so they wouldn't right. be bought but uh I went through a lot of good pigeons, really good pigeons, and, and a lot of good pigeons from guys that nobody knew at the time that really made impacts. And uh, in the early days, most of the birds I bought over, I would say, were as good as anything that was in the States, if not better. And because I was selecting them from the best guys. And so in the early days of CBS, the birds that went out, all impacted wherever they went. Right. They made big impacts because they were high quality pigeons at a reasonable price. And, um, you know, back in those days in the States, we had good homers. We right. didn't have so much of the speed birds. With, with, and it's, it's changed now. It's not that way, of course. Everybody has quality now. Yeah, but, it's everywhere uh, with the social media and the way you can go on. Yeah, you can order and buy online and right. you see what's going on. So yeah. it, it's all changed. So my timing was good. And I built CBS. At the height of CBS, I had 500 breeders pairs. Wow. And uh, bred 5,000 youngsters a year and sold out. And sold out. That's incredible. And, and we had... Uh, Hall of Fame winners. We had New England Open winners that I banded and just, but like I said, the quality of the animals were high and I was able uh, to select good ones. I mean, I, I 
basically what I did is I got rid of the ones I didn't like. And, you know, when I go to select, right. if, something, if something didn't look right, I wouldn't take it. And so I tried to bring in high quality pigeons continually. And usually I would try to bring in a, a, a group every year of something new or two groups every year because I had a, at one time I had 12,000 clients in CBS. Oh, wow. 12,000 clients. And so I had regular customers that uh, they call it what's new, you know, what's right. new, I want something yeah. different. And so I always tried to have something different and, and something new. And, uh, and so, and then I ran CBS, like at, at the height of the business, I had seven employees, not counting me. And uh, uh, we built, I actually built a web page early in the early days and it really didn't take off. I let it sit for two years and finally web pages were working and I redid the whole thing and I hired a full-time webmaster in the office too. And I had two secretaries and a full-time, then they ended up hiring full-time salesmen to help me. And I was traveling in the early days a lot. I would have auctions and do seminars and whatever I could do to stimulate the business. And I was, I was traveling in the winter months a lot. I, I mean, when I mean a lot, maybe two spots on the weekend, hit a place right. Saturday and a different place Sunday and um, try to build a business. And it went well. It went Absolutely. very well. Well, that's, that's pretty cool the way you were uh, forward thinking on getting the newspapers in to figure out results and, you know, getting a web page set up before it was really a thing. All those things were really big moves. Um, what were you looking for when you went over there? Obviously results that you saw, but when you were handling the birds, what were you looking for that you liked? Well, I like a medium pigeon. One of the things you learned is, as an example, if you're selling to Florida, they want medium to small. Right. If you're selling to Canada, they want medium to big. And so you learned what areas liked what things. Right. I wanted something that had sales appeal. Right. The example is I didn't buy bandana bills for a long time because they were too vanilla. They were, and mo when I sold pigeons, uh, I shipped them to you in a box. You opened the box and if you didn't like them, that didn't do me any good. So right. I wanted to make sure they were attractive. And there was several pigeons I didn't take because they were too big or they uh, just were vanilla. And I can tell you stories where uh, I had pigeons from a guy named Van Ryan Cluck, who was king of the Antwerp Union 13 times. Wow. And he was a superstar in the uh, 60s, 70s. And the union was huge then. And his pigeons were the origin of the Van Loons. Wow. The origins of the Lean Boars. And they were tremendous. And he was still racing uh, when I went there. And matter of fact, I flew in the club with him, but uh, in the St. Job Club. But uh, his pigeons had zero eye sign. They were just as vanilla in the eye as you could see. And they were just, they handled fine. But I had a guy that wanted some of them. And he, uh, I said, now they don't have any eye sign of any kind. No, that's okay. I, I want good pigeons. So you'll be, I said, okay, they're good pigeons. He uh, got them, sent them back, no eye sign. Oh, no. So I used to always, when I did seminars, I would say, you know what's the most important thing about eye signs? And uh, da, 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 they give me all these stories. I said, no, it's sales. The most important thing is it's sales. Right. And, and that's a Jan Ardens. Or, you know, the Jan Ardens were absolutely the most beautiful pigeons you could buy at one time. There was right. nothing prettier, nothing softer feather another with better eyes but yeah, they're the not eyes. the style pigeons we need in, in this country right because they're bred for being in the crate three or four days and they're more passive and and um and, and they're almost two-day race pigeons to some extent so anyway but so i really got reached the point that i was trying to get middle distance pigeons that scored at 300 miles and up and, uh, but I've had some real success with sprint pigeons. On the early years, uh, I went to a, I was trying to find Van Ryan Cluck's loft. And I went to the post office in Merksum, is where he lived. And a guy came in there that spoke English pretty well. And he worked on the freight docks on the harbor in Antwerp. 
And Merksum is right next to Antwerp, suburb of Antwerp. And anyway, I told him I was trying to find Van Ryan Cook. And he goes, I know him. I know him. <laughs> his English was living. So he tucked me to his house. Then he said, I know another champion. And it was a sprint champion, a guy named Ludo Adriansis. And he tucked me to his house. And anyway, I bought a cock from Ludo Adriansis that went seven first wow. at 60 mile races. And I bought a hen from Cook. And that pair bred. Uh, a Hall of Fame winner, several superstars, bred maybe the best pigeon I've ever flown in my life. He flew every race in the Sooner Club here in Oklahoma City for four years. Never missed a race. Wow. 100, 600 miles. And he was sold to Taiwan. He was from 87, the first year of the breeding station. And uh, his number is 185. And he was sold to Taiwan for $7,000 back in about 90. 1990 and but he bred a u hall of fame winner and wow. what's funny this i was in belgium just a few weeks ago and i was in the club in shilda where my friend van alsecker was and one of the guys sat next to him was a good friend of the salute of all oh wow and we talked about it he was amazed that i flew that pigeon 500 miles and won with him but because adrianson only flew 60 and 100 mile races but they were special birds. They they had a mentality to, to get home. Yeah, but, think, uh, the, don't you think homing ability is a bit underrated in valuation of pigeons? To some extent. The only reason I would disagree a little bit with it is we have such screwy races anymore. We seem to lose so many youngsters that that would be my only exception to it. But right. I think, but honestly, you're right. For a long period of time, uh, Pure homers, we had homers. We didn't have the speed in them. And right. when we bought, and I'll give you an example. I bought the lean boars in 82, the first year I moved to Oklahoma City. And they were all late breads. And I got a handful of youngsters out of them for 83 young birds. I think I had 10 youngsters out of them because they were like October hatches from the year before. So I put those 10 youngsters on my race team with 40 of my other pigeons I had at the time. And they were my first European pigeons. And my best five pigeons came out of those 10. Oh, wow. And on training tosses, I'd often get seven or eight of the lean boars two minutes ahead of my other birds. And the next year, that family of birds I'd had since high school, I got rid of every one of them. Because I the realized those birds had the speed. I, they couldn't beat these other birds. Right. They couldn't beat them. Right. They just, they couldn't beat them. And uh, they just were better pigeons, better pigeons. Um, wow. But uh, what else would you like to know? Well, I wanted to go into, you're talking about middle distance. Then wh how did you end up meeting Serge Van Elsacker? Because you hooked me up with, with Serge when I went over to Belgium in 22. And there isn't, you know, he's one of the best guys, not just racing wise, but he's just a really good guy. He's a great guy. Yeah. And, um, you know, he's very kind with me and his time and guidance. And uh, it made my time over there exceptional. So how did you all meet? Well, it's interesting. Uh, uh, we'll step back from that a little bit and we'll build to it. Uh, in uh, 85, I went over with Horst Hackamer again. And we were only there two or three days and Horace's father was in an accident and he had to leave and go back to the States. And it left me there by myself for another 10 days. And I only knew three or four people there at that time. And so I went to, uh, I saw a sign for the natural breeding station. Oh, wow. And I followed the sign and I went there and I met Andre Rodal. And at that time I was, I was first vice pres president of the AU. So I had a business card to open the door a little bit, so to speak, you know, and he spoke a little bit English at the time. And now he speaks perfect. But uh, anyway, uh, so I got in with Andre and Andre was willing to take me around to places. And there wasn't a better guy, more respected guy at the time than Andre. And one of his good friends was a friend named Willie Van Hecken. Mm -hmm. And Willie's the character. And Willie is close friends with Serge. And so I met Willie that trip and became friends. And he told Serge that I was coming back over and Serge wrote me a letter. He had my address and invited me to come and visit him. 
And so I did. And we just hit it off. And uh, we just became real close friends. We've traveled a lot together. We went to Taiwan together a couple of times. We've been uh, everywhere. And he, he invited me to fly partners with him if I'd like to. At the, initially, we were going to fly uh, the Barcelona, the long distance races. And uh, he wanted to do it. So I actually bought two lofts, put them in his yard. He had the large yard there. And, right. uh, and uh, we raced. And we had some successes. And I actually, the first season, I brought over 50 youngsters from CBS. Can't do that now, but I brought and them how over. How did you, because he joked that you brought them on your suitcase. How did you do that? Actually, I had a dog kennel, a big one that you could put a, a German Shepherd in. And I put three levels. They had the bottom level and two leather levels. Then I put 50 youngsters in it. Oh, wow. And I had paperwork from the vets. David Marks a well-known bed. He gave me all the certificates and everything I needed. And when I got there and I, I shipped them with me as, as pets and I only had to pay a small shipping fee because I only had one kennel and, uh, Very you smart. know, maybe 150 bucks or something. Right. And to bring 50 birds. And then as we got to, uh, and I got to customs, they, they stopped me and, and I showed them the paperwork and okay. <laughs> and they said, they said, well, we got plenty of pigeons here already. The guy was joking. I said, I know, but I'm bringing you some real good ones this time. <laughs> and he just waved me on. And, <laughs> and I brought birds over probably from time to time. I actually brought Serge a, a hen. I brought her him a hen that was a full sister to my 990 cock. And she, her, he named her Janet Jackson. And she was his, his second best pigeon two years in a row. Wow. And she bred a lot of good pigeons. And she's in his pedigree still. And, um, but... I was able to bring them over back then, and then we didn't have quarantine in Europe. You only had you only had quarantine going to the states, and so it was a lot easier. I mean, you you just had to book them into quarantine in the states, and back in those days, you'd rent. They had a horse stalls, and they'd set them up for pigeons. They'd put some purchase in there, and you could rent the whole room for, for a reasonable price. And like I say, I could put. 120 pigeons in a horse stall sure and, and get them out for about 50 bucks a piece and uh, but uh, no quarantine other than in the states not in europe so it was a lot more reasonable but but then i started racing with surge and we got when we when you race the long distance international races an example is barcelona is shipped on sunday for friday release wow you ship on sunday you don't ship Monday, you ship Tuesday, you ship Pepignon. Wednesday, you ship another national race. Thursday, you ship the Antwerp Union races. Friday, you ship, no, you ship the provincial races, which are a union. And Friday, you ship the Dornan, the 200 mile races. And Saturday, you ship the sprint races for Sunday. So we were, we actually shipped five nights that week. That's a full, first. full on, full time commitment over there. It, it, major commitment. Yeah. And we, Pool, pooling was, we pooled a lot, but the difference is you never won a lot of money. Uh, the pools were like 10 to one. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't hit a home run, but you, uh, if you doubled your money in the pools, you did good. That was about what you right. did. And uh, so it, it was quite an experience. Uh, and, it, and I got to know a lot of, we shipped in, you, some clubs were authorized to ship Barcelona and the international races. Another club is authorized to ship the national races. Another club's authorized to ship the union races. And your local club always ships the sprint races. So we were shipping in three different clubs the same week. Someone like me that's obsessed with all this, that's just so exciting. I'm, I'm jealous that they have yeah. all that. Without Surge, I couldn't have no way figured out what I was, where I was going even. I right. mean, you know, uh, to, but uh, it's totally committed. We were totally committed. And his wife, Kirsten, as you met this character, right. and she, she uh, great. and she uh, was always glad in a way that I was there because she said, Norm, in the races, and he's so obsessed, he won't talk to me. But <laughs> you make him talk. Yeah, so, yeah. So anyway, one time, one of the early races we were clocking, this is kind of funny, and we shipped several it was a tremendous weekend. We shipped six races. 
we won all six races with our first nominated pigeon. Oh, wow. And we, ne we never got close again. But anyway, right. uh, I'm clocking and he turns over to me and he says, you're nervous. You're too nervous. And she looks at him and says, he's too nervous. You're too nervous. Both of you are too nervous. <laughs> I'm getting out of here right now. <laughs> oh, man. It was fun. It was fun. And, and was, we, was, was that at the location he's at now? Yes. Okay. It, when I first met him, he was at another location, not too far from where he lives there. Got it. And he moved, he moved there, whew, 91 or 92, I think. Maybe, may, maybe, yeah, about 91 or 92, somewhere like that. Well, and then uh, I was saying earlier, you have all the, I have these VHS tapes from when you were doing law visits and, you know, you're really on top of that too, as far as recording law visits and communicating with fanciers, letting people see you know, their lofts and their birds and everything. When did you decide to start doing that? Well, actually, as soon as we could do that, I got with a couple guys and I thought it would, would help the business and make you want to buy pigeons from those guys. And you and I thought, you know, the guys that spoke English well enough, we, you, you see how how they did it, what they what they cared about and, and how they took care of their pigeons. You know, I think the most impressive thing and you've been to Belgium is the total care that you see. Absolutely. The total commitment to the game. Right. And that showed that I think in m most of the cases, you know, yeah. I had a guy one yeah. time ask, said, I just want to go see a normal law. I said, well, don't go with me. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not spending all that money to see a normal law. Right. I want to see the best. Well, and I think that the, amount of you know flyers fanciers they have in a club it just you have to have that sort of operation to be competitive and at the top right yeah exactly it you yeah you know like the shilda club when i was there a few weeks ago they had their awards banquet and serge was king of the club which meant he won more than anybody right basically but uh they were giving out everything it was talking about four or five hours and had a meal and everything it was but still you've got so many specialists you know half the country just flies those sprint races right by the 60 mile and the, they fly Quivrain and Wyong and they're always on Sundays and they'll fly midweek if there's a holiday and and uh and there used to be a lot of big money in those races big money in those races and those guys it's social for them it's like a country club I mean, they ship Saturday. They're back in the club with to figure the race is Sunday, and they play cards, tell stories, and it's real social activity. But there's some hardcore sprint racers, mm -hmm. really serious, 100 percent serious, and uh, uh, and those pigeons, I think, have a real. The winners that continually win have a have a real drive, and and, and Flemish is called Mordant. They. They want to get home hard, you know, they maybe put out a little extra and uh, they offer something that I think you can cross in and, and from time to time. And now you see the cattle everywhere, right? You see these pigeons that are based on sprint lofts and uh, that have done that, you know, and have changed that. And, and, but I've seen a dramatic change in Belgium. Uh, when I started going in the eighties, uh, there was, still 50,000, 60,000 pigeon flyers in Belgium. Now there's 25, 30,000. Right. And it's, it's a dramatic drop. There's clubs that don't exist anymore. They merged with other clubs. And, but what's happened is the competition is still as keen as it's ever been. Right. Uh, the big law, there's guys that keep more pigeons than they used to keep and uh, more competition. Uh, the bottom end is gone. You know, the bottom end is gone. Uh, you just got decent flyers and then really good flyers. Right. And uh, and uh, it's it's harder now, I think, to do what I to, – to, if I had to start CBS, it would be extremely difficult now. Right, yeah. Uh, the timing was exquisite. I actually bought one of the Belgium newspapers that called the Rice Doof. I, I became a third owner of it. Oh, wow. And it was about the time the internet was starting, but in the old days, before the internet, the newspapers held the auctions. 
they're the ones because they put out a weekly newspaper. So they have the auction list and they'd be advertising a month ahead of time or two months ahead of time. And then they'd put out the auction list in the newspaper and, and you'd go to the auction and buy through the auction. So I, I had an opportunity to buy into the rice stew, which means racing pigeon. And, uh, and I thought it would help me get heads up on some of these auctions early and maybe get a chance to see the results early. And, uh, but it became complicated for me because I didn't speak Flemish fluently at all. And I could understand a little of it, but realized not enough. And so I eventually sold it back to the other two partners. It just, um, it was a nice idea that really didn't have a lot of merit for me. Sure. Well, I think that when I was in, last time in 22, when I was there, I was surprised that I was able to communicate because a lot of, you know, majority of people are speaking English or a little bit English. I'm sure in the 80s, it was a little more difficult. It was a lot more difficult. Right. If you really had to find somebody to take you around and, yeah. and do it. And if you, the other thing that made it great deal more difficult was finding your way around. Yeah. Without GPS. Right. Without GPS, finding your way and figuring the maps and figuring out where you had to go. And, and, uh, uh, and I learned my way around very well. Man. I mean, I, I don't hardly ever need GPS in Belgium. I've, I've been lost enough. I've had to figure it out. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, no, it, that, that was part of it. And that's why I had contact people like Serge and my buddy Andre and, uh, but I got where I was using Surge in Belgium principally and this fellow Michael Burke in, in Holland. They were English was perfect and and, and uh it, it worked out for both of us well. And uh when you were in Belgium, did you I know you were friends with Van Dyke. Did you ever get to hold the cannibal back when he was around? Probably fifty a hundred times. Yeah, I figured so. so. I was real good friends with Derek Van Dyke. Yeah. I first visited him and, and bought birds from him in nineteen eighty seven. And this is a true story. Serge and I offered Van Dyke $50,000 for Rambo. Oh, wow. The father of father. Cannibal. Cannibal, yeah. But Rambo, before he bred Cannibal, he bred Borges, who was second national Borges against 43,000 pigeons. Wow. And, th and then he bred, he bred Borges while he was on the race team as a yearling, and he won five firsts in the Antwerp Union. Rambo did. Rambo. Yep, and I saw Rambo's father and mother. And uh, I offered to buy the next year he bred Cannibal and Cannibal started winning. He wasn't he wasn't the ace pigeon at that time. It looked like he could be. And uh, I tried to buy him and my wife said two fools met. When I offered him 50 and he turned it down. But oh, wow. it, uh, well, in hindsight, I guess we can't blame him on that. It's no, he and he's clear, he's a good guy. Yeah. There wasn't a nicer man than, than uh, him. He was about 10 years younger. He's about Serge's age. And uh, he had a lot of health issues and they finally succumbed to him. But uh, he, uh, he told me then, he says, he was working at a bus company called Van Hool Bus. There were a lot of the pigeon flyers worked there. And usually made lots of big, big buses. Anyway, uh, he said, you give me enough money where I can quit working, I'll, I'll sell it to you. <laughs> and uh, and he was smart he's smart mm -hmm. and he was but you know it's interesting he liked the sprint races he didn't like the middle distance races the cannibal one right. but cannibal's a very interesting pigeon because there's so many superstars bred down from cannibal it's incredible yeah i mean he, i think if you look at impactful pigeons in the history of the sport he's up there at the top with most impact yeah sure. yeah when you well, think about it this way, this is really interesting. He was the ace pigeon of Belgium. His grandson was the Klein of Dirk mm -hmm. or Koopman, who was the ace pigeon of Holland. I had a grandson of Cannibal called the Red Cannibal, the Road Cannibal. He bred twice the first ace pigeon in America. So the first ace pigeon in America twice, the first ace pigeon of Belgium, and the first ace pigeon of Holland. Our two best pigeons we had, uh, the Wheat Start and Koyan Luke, are off of a sister to the cannibal and a granddaughter to the cannibal. Yeah. So, you know, that it's just, and there's many other lofts that can 
can say that, you know, Harry goes back to the cannibal from sure. Jan Hoyman's. And so the list goes on and on. So do you remember holding the cannibal? Like, can you oh, yeah, he was, what he, he was, was like nice in the hand? No, no, I've had, I actually handle him a lot. Medium. Uh, medium pigeon, real apple body. His dad, Rambo was a little longer cast. And, uh, but he, he produced really nice pigeons. I mean, that line is a nice type of pigeon. And, and uh, initially, when Cannibal was at the height of popularity, uh, Derek, uh, it's it's D I R K. We would say Dirk. Right. He actually in Flemish pronounced it Derek. 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 And Derek. Derek was inbreeding the Cannibal for sales, and about after three or four years, he said, "I've had enough of that." If they want to buy them, they're going to buy them how I breed them. I'm not going to pair them like that. I'm not yeah. going to inbreed anymore. Right. Then he stopped inbreeding so tight. But, uh, of course, then he went he went and bought the DiCaprio cock from, from uh, oh, it went blank. Is it Leo, uh, Leo Harriman? Yeah, Leo, Leo Harriman's. Yeah, he bought DiCaprio. You know, Harriman's had, has had like three sellouts. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the early sellouts. Right. And uh, he bought him, and he was his best racer at the time. And I had four off of him, and they all bred good pigeons. They all bred really, really good. But he was always paired to a daughter cannibal, almost 100% of the time. His mate was a direct daughter cannibal. And um, we've had really good luck with those pigeons. Absolutely. Really good. You know, I, you know, I moved, I retired from CBS basically in 2013. I bought a place in Denton in 2012 and set up to start flying in 2013. And uh, I basically, I gave the business to my son, Steve. Uh, basically, I got out of it because I was tired of the telephone. Yeah. I'm tired of racing. My passion is racing pitches. I just got real tired of the telephone. And I, I pick it up in the morning and never put it down all day almost. Right. Like, line after line. I had three lines and they'd all be busy all the time. So I gave it to Steve and I moved to the Denton area and uh, raced with those guys for five years and more and held my own. Right. Uh, and uh, I had a daughter, Red Campbell down there, 119, who was National Ace Pigeon, 16 first in the Denton Club. And uh, he was a superstar. I had a uh, a cock out of the triple DiCaprio cock back at, that was a superstar that was champion bird of the concourse and uh, bred several winners. And that stuff did extremely well, extremely well. Yeah. And, and you asked me earlier and I'll, I'm, we're rambling here, but uh, what do I look for sorry. in pigeons? Right. I want lines of pigeons that throw lots of winners. And what I mean is, cannibal there's so many winners in the cannibal Absolutely. line you have a chance of getting them repeating repeating winners the van denewells that's another group that's just incredible and the third group for me was the jansons i got and that most of my current good pigeons shall we say since i retired in 13 have all been a blended of those lines just well, blended Let's go back then to your favorite, I would guess, 2000, right? Your, your, your best racer that won, what, five firsts? 990? Well, a 990? Yeah, well, 990 is, is straight, Jansen. Right. And he's an interesting story to some extent. Uh, his mother's a hen called Jade, and she's out of a daughter of the 019. I mean, out of the son of the 019 called Jeff. His name was Jeff. And he had a tremendous record. She, Jeff had like 12 times in the first 10 of three, 4,000 pigeons. Wow. And he was a tremendous pigeon. And I paired him, paired to him called the pedigree hen. The reason she got named the pedigree hen, she was on my pedigree. She was the background of the pedigrees. But she was gorgeous. She was straight chance. And, well, I had, and in my record books back then, and still when I kept records, I would write, a band number 3371 is a hen and she's out of Jeff and the pedigree hen. 
if I'm breathing out of that hen, if I, she hadn't had a name yet. Well, all of a sudden, when 990 got hot, he was tremendous. My best two-year-old was was out of her, and my best young bird was out of her, out of Jade, with three different cocks. And I didn't realize it until all, because all I looked at the records that were out of Daughters of Jeff, and finally hit me three different years around the same daughter, Jeff. And, uh, but 990 won five first. Uh, they won first AU Hall of Fame. He, uh, and the, that year that he won five first, the first race of the year in Old Birds, I'm flying straight with a hook cox, not flying the hens. I go, I get, I'm on the phone all the time. I'm basking in birds for the race. So, I got a wood hood crates in there and I go grab 990, put him in the crate, get the next one, put him in the crate, the next one. I go to the club to pull out 990 and it's it's his hen. Oh no. And so he didn't fly the first race of the year. Oh wow. Because I just reached up and I thought I had him and it wasn't I'm on the phone talking to yeah, somebody right, trying, right. trying to sell a pigeon. And uh but he, he then proceeded to win a 200, 300, 400, and a 500 four weeks in a row. That's incredible. And then he won another race after that. And then I stopped him. I wouldn't race him anymore. Was he, was I right that he was 2000? Yes. Okay. He and just died two weeks ago. He was oh, 24 okay. years old. I, I was there for the Continental Classic that Steve yeah. has, and he was still alive then. Yeah, yeah. I got to see him he, one last time. I didn't know he passed. Yeah, he just died two weeks ago. Wow. And uh, one of my favorite birds on this, on my old bird team, is uh, inbred from him. But, you know, 990 here again, his daughter bred a hen called Cowboy, who was third national ace pigeon. And Cowboy bred Dakota, who was second national ace pigeon. And I flew those in Dallas. And they were superstars. And and uh, they, I've had just superstar after superstar with those pigeons and actually i had thunder who was out of the red cannibal who won seven first and thunder mother was down from the jansons and the father was a red cannibal and he won seven first and he was a little big matter of fact i had people tell me he was too big to race and i said don't tell him he's won three four hundred fifty yeah. miles and he's won seven races and um uh, and um uh, but I've had numerous, numerous good pigeons. Another granddaughter won six first of his. And um, so just really good. But those prepotent lines, what I call prepotent, that produce champions after champions, I think when you mix those together, that's that's the way to go. You get two prepotent families crossed in together, and that's where your big time racers are coming from. Yeah, and I think you can then take them back one way or the other, and they still keep happening. They still keep happening. Absolutely. And, and I've seen it over and over, and uh, it's just uh, – there's some other lines. Steve's right now has the Cosmore line that seems to be working real well, and uh, he has uh, some other stuff that seems to be doing well. But still, those basic lines have been hard to beat. Absolutely. They've been extremely hard to beat. Well, and, and, you know, I don't know how many times you've been first national, you know, President's Cup. Do you have a count on that? I see plaques behind you, but do you know how many times? Here is the, I haven't done that. You know, I'm national champion this year. This you know? year, yeah. You bumped out my buddy, Ken Crater. Has he called you yet? No, but i tell you something. I'll give Steve, here's one from the, the, the first national champion law ball distance award, 22. Uh, but, uh, I, there's, I have 15 awards from national first national championships, but I also have eight or nine before they started doing these where I had, uh, 990. I had a, I had a hand called Mandy. I had the 185 cock. I had a hand called Margaret. They were all for a first AU hall of fame winners. And, and those plaques have disappeared in my moves. I don't Right. Know. Right. The plates, they were regular plaques. The plates fell off of them anyway. But uh, uh, I raced for that. That's my ambition every year is to try to score in the national championships. And uh, and uh, I've got a couple pretty good competitors. And to give Steve some credit, 
the na I'm national champion young bird. Third is Mike Ludolph from Minnesota. And he only flies CBS birds. He don't even breed. And fifth is a brand new flyer. The first year he's ever flown named Steve Maddox in our club here. And he's fifth national yeah, champion. I saw that he's name. CBS. So yeah. three, three of the top five are flying CBS birds. And they're basically those bloodlines we're talking about. Right. They're basically those bloodlines. But no, I, you know, that's something I shoot for. And uh, when I was flying in Dallas, I shot for the fraternities. They had, at, when I first moved down there, we had six different money races. I won five of them one year. And, uh, but uh, I won the NTF, which is the big one, two years in a row, second two years of the five years I was down there. And then, uh, uh, but uh, that's my passion. That's my yeah. life. That's, that's incredible, the longevity. And, you know, what, what at this point, uh, you know, you're still, you still love flying, still love racing. And, and, you know, what, what, what do you enjoy so much about it that keeps you going year after year on it? I think it's just a challenge, you know, and, and I really like flying uh, individual birds and be able to put, you know, as if you've studied to win the national championships, the key is getting every bird you send to score. Right. And, the, and, uh, and the way to win it is to ship five. And win the first five, right? And and uh, or or put four in the first five out of, out of your five, you know, or ship eight and put eight all the top. And so I enjoy that challenge and getting to know the pigeons well enough that I can pick them and do that. that yeah, selection comes into play big time in that situation. You're yeah. not just sending them and hoping. You're 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 really studying yeah. which what birds you're going to send, and that takes being a pigeon fancier. It's not about yeah about yeah. Luck. You know, I tell, I've told, I've got this brand new guy here in the club that's done extremely well. He only lives two miles from me, and I, he's trained every trainer toss with me, and I'm, new, I'm helping him all I can, and uh, and he gives me all the credit. I'll say that, but he says, "Why would you tell me that? You, I can beat you." I said, "You'll beat me occasionally." And I said, <laughs> "So many things happen every day in the loft that I can't tell you about unless I see them happening." Right. You know, I can't tell you that you need to do this because that this happened. Right. Or you need to. And I said, I can give you 90 percent of it. Write it down. But the last 10 percent is an art. You just develop the sense of development. Yeah, you have to go through experience. And, you, uh, experience I, you know, I've been really lucky to learn from my dad. But sure. although, although he's taught me, you know, and I've been very lucky, I've had to learn a lot of tough lessons just we experiencing it. And so, you know, I think that's really important to have that trial and error and, and to recognize issues and make adjustments. Well, you know, the sad thing is when you lose those stars, mm -hmm. those superstars, you always ship them one too many times. You know, uh, I went for a long time, didn't hardly lose any of them. And, I, and most of the best ones I kept, but I did lose a, a, a couple good ones and that really bothers me. And, yeah. and to lose them off the loft. I had a hen uh, the first year of, I moved here in this location in uh, three years ago. It'll be four years ago this year, this summer, June. And I put the birds in the loft June 17th because I bought the house. Actually, I made a deal with the guy and put up enough money to let me start building the loft before we actually closed the, the house out. And I put youngsters in there June 17th. I flew them lightly, and then they were national champions in all birds. And, uh, in uh, 20 and 21 and, and 21 uh, from this location. But uh, I had a hen there that was a real star. She was, I think, seventh national ace pigeon, something. And I may be wrong, but up in that category, top 10. And I lost her off the loft. To a hawk? I guess. Yeah. Was no longer there. You right. Know? And, uh, she hit something or something got her and, yeah. and those kind of things that are really bad. You know, you hate to lose something special because, you know, I think example this year, I, I've got all my youngsters already. I went to Steve and got roughly 48 youngsters and I got the last of them yesterday and that, but I bred 32 off my race team and 
there's about 10 to get moved over next week. And that'll be, that'll be 80 youngsters. So that's what I'll have this year to start with. And, uh, but, uh, uh, and I take first rounders and I don't think that's mandatory, but actually Steve, he sells it. People up north, most people don't want the early January birds. They want the next rounds. So they're available for me to get them then. Right. And I actually go there and just pick them. And I even take, I just go through them and I eliminate something I don't like. But I don't even know what they're out of until they start scoring. And then he, I'll, I'll say, send me the pedigree. Right. But so I really have no prejudged. Now, I can tell who's a lot of proud of because I, my, my old 19 chances have feather on those feet, and I've got four or five like that. So we know they're down from that line and maybe cross. And then uh, uh, I can just, a lot of dark checkers, I can tell they're from uh, some of the cannibal lines we, we got, and uh, we have some there. And so other than that, though, I really don't know. And I don't really care. I don't need to know anymore. I, it's it's all about racing. Once they start proving to me who they are, then I want to know. Exactly. They they, I they come breed. through the trap. I, I don't breed anymore, except off the race team. But and I do miss that. And but it's good for Steve that I race those pigeons. Right. So he he gets to see them. Absolutely. He gets, he gets to see the results and, and helps prove them out. And normally I don't take them off the champions. I take them off the children of the champions, because if he can sell them for sell them easy for good money, then I'll leave them for him. Sure. And, and I take the others and I get good ones out of them every year. But I tell you something interesting this past year, I kept 16 young birds from the old young bird season. We had, I had, a, I had a funky start to this season. Right. I had a real funky start and I did, I tried some new vaccines and it didn't work out. I didn't like it. And they straightened out eventually, and I was a national champion. But I, of the 16 youngsters I kept, nine of them are out of my race team. Oh, and wow. I, and I only banded 28 out of my race team But last year. But when you think about it, those are the birds that flew the best. They've been right. cold already, and they're kept over. Now, are you putting them together or are you just letting them be together? Do you have a strategy no, I, that? I try to put them together a little bit, but I'm not hardcore about it. Uh, I try to put a, I try to pair certain ones together that I want, but basically my philosophy is there's not going to be anything. I have 42 old birds I'm going to fly now, this year. And I don't want an old bird in there I don't think can't win. Right. So, so if I think if you've got good ones to start with, good ones will come out of them. Sure. And, and I think I used to really be hung up on thinking I could pair, and I think I can pair well. But I also think that if you if you only got quality birds in the pen, you're going to be okay. Yeah, they'll figure it out too, and and help yeah. you there. Yeah. You, you'll get good ones. I actually make sure I don't inbreed too much is what right. more so than anything. Right. But when I pair, I tell you, I'll tell you how I like to pair. I like to, what I call compensate mating. I like to pair, pair different color colors together. I like to pair different color eyes together. If I got a small bird, I want it. I always breed back to medium, mm -hmm. a large bird back to medium, not a large to small. I always breed back to medium. And, uh, I want a real soft feather. I want balance. Uh, buoyancy is, I think, I think buoyancy is a means that bird's an athlete. I think when you handle a bird that's very buoyant, he's athletic. That makes and sense. Can, yeah. And he can take a lot of races. And I think the key is fine. I want pigeons that can race every week, week after week after week up front. And I'm not convinced. A lot of people think they come in and out of shape. I don't believe it. I think when you put them in shape, you can keep them in shape for the season. Just proper yeah. management. Yeah, proper. Now, if they have a bad weekend and they come home a day and a half late, yeah, now you got to lay off. You got to let them build back up. But, but most of my best pigeons fly every race for the season. You know, 
And the ones that are at the top are what you go forward with. And that's how you build up the type of family of pigeons that you've been able to build up over the years. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so what would you say for my audience ranges from experience down to new flyers? What would you say to somebody who's new that's starting out? They are, they don't have the option to start out with the champions that you and I would have. Where What would you say for them as far as how to get started in 2024? I think there's two stories there. I think the first thing is don't get too crazy about picking pigeons. Learn how to race pigeons. Learn how to keep them healthy. You know, I went through a cycle where I was hung up on iSign in my early days. I was totally convinced iSign was everything. And now I don't hardly even look at it. Right. Uh, Now I think learn what it takes to race week after week after week learn how to how to feed them learn how to keep them healthy learn how to help them recover from a race if you race well your selection becomes well because the best show you what they can do now to get started i don't think i think you can get good pigeons now for not a lot of money uh too many people want to buy the real expensive pigeons uh a direct son of cannibal uh, and they'll pay a fortune for it. And if you were to pay $5,000 for a son of cannibal, how many grandchildren could you buy with that amount of money? Right. Or good grand. And so if you were to buy one pigeon for 5,000 or 40 youngsters for 5,000, take the 40 youngsters. Right. Because the odds are going to, you'll find some in there that will do the job. And you may have made a mistake on the one, the one, you, it, it may not do it. I've bought some real expensive birds, Jeff, that didn't work out, that were superstars. I mean, not children of stars, but stars. I bought a cock called the O5, D O5. He flew in a combine of 200 members. He was champion of the combine twice and second champion bird once. And he was gorgeous. He bred one good pigeon and he was paired to a superstar hen when he bred her. And I got another cock and I think I paid $5,000, $7,000 for him in that range at the time. I bought another cock, which was a guy's second best cock for a thousand dollars. And that cock bred winner after winner. I had a very famous fancier. I won't name names because I don't know if he wants me to share it. So, but he said that a lot of the Chinese buyers are obsessed with direct children of his top birds. But he said, when I visited him, he said, if you buy a great grandchild or a grandchild, you have just as good a chance as buying direct because those genetics is what you're after and the right type of build that you're looking for, for your course, because here in Oklahoma is going to be different than what someone up North may want or down in Florida where they need a little smaller birds. So, you know, I think that goes to your point for sure. Well, and that's what we, even goes back to the point that we were saying that by the bloodlines that produce lots of champions. And so the birds I'm getting from Steve, these 48 youngsters I got so far this year, they're all from the, basically from those bloodlines. They're basically from the lines that produce winners, but they're bred off grandchildren and they're not bred off the direct children. And, uh, and I'll find some in that group that, you know, that will be really good pigeons. And, but I think you need to try to get good pigeons from key bloodlines. Well, but what I, I don't think you have to spend a fortune. I think it's like you said, buy, buy them from the right group, from the right line. Let them be grandchildren or great grandchildren. If they're bred from, and you've got to trust the guy you're getting them from, uh, you know, maybe there's somebody in your club that you can get a, a late hatch round from or somebody that you feel comfortable with. Um, you know, starting in pigeons is not inexpensive. It's, it costs some money these days, but fishing costs money. Right. Playing costs money. And I think you've got to decide at what level you want to be in this game. Exactly. And if you really want to be crazy like me and you, <laughs> that's one thing yeah if you want to just enjoy it with your family and watch them come home and that's another level and if that brings you personal satisfaction and 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 you enjoy it then accept it accept it you know 
Well, yeah, I think uh, also finding somebody in the area that can mentor you with good advice. I get a lot of people that call and they're not getting much help from people. But I think in order for the sport to grow, people need to open up and, and talk to each other and help new fanciers and, you know, get started with some good, solid advice and having a mentor and in your area, you know, somebody that's flown the area and knows what type of bird it takes. Well, I, exactly. It, it can, they can keep you from making the mistakes they've made. In the past. I always right. say the good thing about me, I've had a pretty good memory and if I make a mistake, I won't repeat it for 20 years, but then maybe <laughs> 20 years I'll do right. it again. Yeah. But, but uh, hopefully every, it's only happens every 20 years. Right. But we all do some stupid things. And, and the least number you do, the better off you're going to be in this game. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and, uh, not, not being set, you know, in their ways, being stubborn about it, but adjusting to what's happening with the season. Yeah. I, I think I'll, I'll say one other thing. Um, uh, uh, you know, I, when I've given seminars, which I've given a lot of them, I, I said, there's three things that, you, you can't feed special enough. You can't medicate special enough and you can't train special enough to have a champion. That champion has to have been bred from those key bloodlines we're talking about. He has to be there. Now, if you don't feed well enough, you don't medicate correctly and you don't train them sufficiently, they may not be a champion. Right. But still you've got to have the bloodlines there. And, uh, you know, People say, I've, you've heard people say this, I know, that some guys win, it, pigeons win in spite of the fancier. Right. They're exceptional pigeons and they're able to win. And um, But when you go to the top lofts in Belgium, if they don't win, it's usually the bird's fault because those guys are doing everything right. Yeah, by the book. They're working the hard. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're as crazy as we are. So they're just totally dedicated and it's at a level that demands it that demands it and uh but uh, uh but i think someone gets started uh learn the game about racing and learn health and i'll give you the, the main health things i do right quick it's pretty simple i'm a pretty much plain water guy but i do treat there's a new product they used to be doxy t was the drug of choice right. now they have Rest one called respiratory. triple vet. they have one called triple vet it's the same product with uh, Swanaville in it, besides Doxy and Thailand. And it's made by the Australian vet also, and Triple Vet. I use that now instead of Doxy T. And because you cannot see mycoplasmosis in a pigeon. If he has mycoplasmosis, which is an upper respiratory problem, you can't see it. You will not know it. He can train well. He can fly two hours well. He may fly three hours well. But when he goes to four hours, he's late. So I treat with that before I start training. I treat maybe just before the races or after the first race in between. How many days? I First time I treat seven days, seven days. The first, like I haven't treated yet. My, I'm just starting to train this week. Same. Over. I'm just starting to train. Well, I, I mentioned to you, I still have, 10 youngsters to wean. When those 10 youngsters come out of the pen, then I'll start treating. I'll start, but I'm, I don't need to, I don't want to treat them until those, all the youngsters are gone out of, out of the pen. But I've, I've had four training tosses this week. I went every day this week so far. And, uh, but uh, the other thing is the PMV rota vaccine. That's mandatory. Absolutely. That's mandatory. Roto, this young bird sickness, we used to have gobs of problems with. Roto has controlled it. It's eliminated it. And we just don't see it. You've got to do that. Uh, it, and you can't, it, it, you know, when I was flying in Texas, we hooked up with the lab down in the Dallas area that was, when we had problems, we were having young bird sickness, having losses. And it always came back, circle virus and mycoplasmosis. And so when I get the lab checks, that was the only two things I got where I was checking for. Now, I treat seven days with, with the 
triple vet before the season. During the season, if I want to feel like I'm ready to, to treat again, I'll treat, I'll have it in the water Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, four days. So when they return home on a race Saturday, that's when it begins. Yeah, it'll be in the water then. Okay. And maybe five days. If, I, if I'm if i not racing well, if I think there's something going on, I may go five days, but usually four days. And several years ago when I was racing in Dallas, I had a race, and it was kind of a, a, a unique race. I wasn't getting drops. Normally, on the shorter race, I'm going to get three or four together when we're talking 200 down. It was 200 mile race. I won the race, but it was too far in between. They were, they were spread out. And I thought, they're not right. So I drove to the lab. I went ahead and started them on Doxy T then because that's what the drugs were. Yeah. But I took throat swabs when they come home from the race before I put them. I didn't put them on Doxy T till Sunday. I took throat swabs Saturday night, put them in a Ziploc, drove to that lab Monday morning and Monday night I had mycoplasmosis. I took swabs Thursday, went back to the lab and they were clear. So they just had a light case of it. Right. And you caught it early and and four days. I wouldn't tell you four days would normally have been enough, but it, it it was. And they'd been treated three or four weeks before for seven days. So, and it seems to be more of a problem in the heat in young birds than it does to old birds. Got it. Okay. I give a lot of minerals. I mix four or five grits together, granite, oyster shell, two or three different grits. And I buy a, a mineral products that's for, for livestock, one called Sweet Licks. And just a good minerals and mix them all together. And I give a lot of that. And they'll eat it. They'll peck at it. And they like it. And uh, I think minerals are important. I think that we, I don't give vitamins. I haven't given vitamins in 30 years, 40 years, maybe. Uh, because grains are fortified with vitamins. Uh, but they lack the minerals they used to have because our farmers are, are uh, growing out of the same fields year after year and they've got to fertilize to make them produce. Right. So makes sense. I, that minerals, I use the minerals, and uh, but I like just clear water, and uh, uh, I just watch how they exercise. I can tell you how they exercise, how they're going to fly. If they're up, and they want to be up together, want to fly, then I know they're going to race well. They're going to race well. Young birds, there's been seasons that I trained a lot, meaning. Even when the season came, I'd go three days a week, four days a week. And there's been seasons where I didn't train, but one day a week. And I flew just as good because they were still offline. One of the problems we're seeing now is the heat is hanging on longer and longer for young birds. And it's harder to keep them flying uh, to really get them up and going good because of the darn heat. You know, and if you separate cocks and hens and fly them separate, so wherever you exercise separate is too already too warm. Too warm, yeah. yeah. And so that's been an issue, and I've trained, I've done it. And I've had seasons where I flew well, but I didn't law fly when I had hawk issues. I only trained. Yeah, to train. keep the hawks off guard. Yeah, yeah. So that's the stuff you can't you can't write it down because the next year they're exercising and doing what they want to do you and you see it, you know. The next year that you've got hawks, you gotta train more. And that's so, exactly what we're talking about is being able to adjust to what's going on. And that's part of being a pigeon fancier is your adjustments to what's going on. Do you pull nine and 10 on young birds? I pull the 10th. 10th. Because I have first rounders. Gotcha. You know? So last year I had a slower moat. I should have pulled the ninth last year. And I always pull them in June. Same. Around, I'm on the lights right now. Uh, they, the lights come on at four o'clock in the morning right now. And uh, I'll turn the lights off middle of May, middle of May, somewhere around then. And then, uh, but I write down what in June when I go to pull them and I pox them then. I do pox the young birds in June. When I pox them and pull that flight and I treat them for lice again. And 
I uh, write down what flight they're on. And I noticed last year I had, you know, birds, I think it was June 15th or something. I had birds that were on the eighth flight, seventh flight. And I had birds, I had birds that were on uh, the third flight. I don't know. Right. You know, I don't know heat affects them or whatever, but that was the biggest span I've seen in a while. So I'm kind of going to watch this year. I may pull the knife this year. Do you do anything with the tail or do you leave it alone or do you? No, I don't. I don't. I, and I know a lot of people do, but I just feel like if you pull too many feathers at one time to be grown in, what's the quality of the feather? Right. When it grows in. And I usually, I've never had an issue with the tail. I mean, there still may be both the last one or two tails when I'm training. But of course, we race later than here where you are and I am than a lot of people. Right. And, and we've got now, well, we don't usually start till the first week of October. Right. You know, when I was in the 80s, we started the second week of September. And now we're into October because the heat just stays there. Yeah, we're, we're, we're starting old birds next month which you know march which is a bit earlier than usual just because uh, we there's a couple factors for us but you know june it gets so warm now you know you're not sure what it's going to look like so we're going to start a little bit earlier you know again adjusting yeah well we've done that we start the 17th or 16th whatever the date that is uh 16th i think and but we have a club 100 mile race that day and usually we have always have a club what we call it jumped up race or uh, club race to start so everybody can check their chips and make sure all sure. everything correct and their clocks are working and, and we have a club and then we start the combine at 150 uh the next week and um and we're done now we're usually done by the middle of may and we fly 10 weeks counting the club race so and same way in young birds we fly 10 weeks counting the club race so, but, uh, we're going to try something different this year. The last two years in young birds, our first combine races have been terrible. Lots of losses, lots of losses. So I came up with the idea that everybody liked it. I was trying to think, how can we stop, especially all the newer guys from losing all these pigeons? They don't have anything left to fly old birds, you know? And so uh we're going to fly three races on our own and start the combine at 200 miles hmm. that way the birds get some experience coming I, guess, out. I think it's helping that it will help the new guys immensely because i don't think those guys are prepared as well sure. as you or i would be sure and this way they get three weeks to get them because last year we flew out of south and our club race was fine it was a normal day. They came good. It's a hundred miles. Everybody got almost everybody home. I mean, I didn't hear of any losses. The next week was a 150 mile race. It was a disaster. Right. And the one of the troubles I think is we have Elk City, which is 110 miles west of us. We've got a few guys in Chandler, which is 30 miles this way. So we got 140 mile front and 150 miles away. Right. And I know yeah. Tulsa is even worse. Yeah, we have a lot of people spread out and young birds are so inexperienced in learning that that's a lot to ask of them right away and so anyway we're going to try that this year whether it works or not but actually uh the elk city club likes the idea because they're driving 110 miles with the birds on the trailer so they right. can just take their turn call the first three and then we'll jump in yeah makes sense so well i've taken up a lot of your time and i really appreciate it the the final question i wanted to ask you uh is there anything you haven't covered or wanted to add that you'd like to talk about? I can't think of anything right now, Jeff. Yeah. We kind of went all over the road. There, yeah, we so. did. It was a lot of fun. I, I, uh, I'm really enjoying this format of having conversations because people, you know, want to learn and, and especially from someone like you, that's been at the top of the game for so long. So I do have one thing. Sure. I say. Our club this weekend is having a little seminar and a meet and greet. And let me tell you what's brought that about. We have two younger guys in the club, maybe 30, 30 or even late. They've worked the internet for the last two months, Facebook and all the particulars. And we have seven people coming to a meeting this weekend. 
uh, that don't raise pigeons, that have pigeons. And they, so we're going to have a little meet and greet deal. And uh, we didn't want to have it at a club meeting. They don't need to hear all the club issues. Right. right. So Tom Beard and I are going to give a little answer questions, give a little health seminar, because That's we great. also had seven new members from last year. And so we're, we've got a nice little growth coming. So we're going to have that. And uh, to try to help the new members, like you're saying, yeah, and that's awesome. Hope, hopefully, we if we can get two or three members out, that'd be wonderful. Yeah, that'd be incredible. And I think that's what it's going to take is uh, raising awareness and having those meetings and uh, yeah. you know stuff like this. I'm hoping that people can see this and and learn from it and be excited about the possibilities. And you know, as you said, deciding what level they want to play on and if they yeah. want to be crazy like we are here's here's a, a blueprint yeah. to do it so and and that's the approach i'm going to take this weekend with these guys and just say there's several levels and maybe your time commitment with your family right now won't let you go to the upper level right you know we have a guy I talked to today that's only flew one year and he's moving he's going to be flying young birds this next year again but he's got kids and basketball this weekend and he can't come to the meeting you know? right and and so as long as he's interested, he's still hanging in there. Those kids are getting older, then maybe he'll jump yeah. up the next step. You know? Yeah, keep it, keep him, you know, interested, keep him around, and maybe it'll finally happen for him. I have several friends that are in that same boat that want to fly, but the timing's not quite right. But yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I know you're not, you don't want to answer the phones anymore, and you've retired in 2013, but do we want to give a shout out to Steve and CBS? Is it cbspigeon.com? Yeah, cbspigeon.com. Uh, like I say, we've had it since 87. He He's working hard at it, and uh, he's still producing quality, like I say. Well, matter of fact, the first ace young bird in the nation last year was bred off. The cock was directly from CBS, and the hen was out of two CBS birds. Wow. So three of the top five national young bird champions and the first ace all have CBS blood. So there's – and you can buy youngsters from him very reasonable. Yeah, it's incredible. And, you know, he's uh, like you has gotten the benefit, or, you know, like me, I should say, has gotten the benefit of learning from you as I've gotten to learn from my dad. Yeah. And, you know, Steve's yeah. awesome. And so he also has the Continental Classic that can yes. be found on the CBS Pigeon website. Yeah. That is gotten and going he, again. So he works hard on it. He's full time. He has two guys working the law with him every day. Yeah, so, and I was in it last year. Uh, his, you know, you all, he took a break from one law for a few years with, you know, spending time with his family but when you talk about training and the birds being in shape and ready to go that was an awesome race that he put together so yeah they came good they came really good that day yeah, yeah. all right thank well, you, great Jeff. thank you for your time i really appreciate it and i'll have to have you on again we'll keep talking pigeons and so all right, all right. thank, thank you. you very much appreciate it Bye. thanks everybody